We're halfway through the week. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Kim Young-gil in Seoul. Coming up on today's edition of Business Daily. The International Monetary Fund has upgraded Korea's economic growth forecast to 3% this year, with global trade and demand from China's both on the rebound. Korea's nuclear reactor designs have gained Europe's approval, allowing the current designed reactors to enter the European market, as well as South Africa and Egypt, which require European standards. Stay tuned for these stories and more. The International Monetary Fund has hiked Korea's economic growth forecast for both 2017 and next year to 3%. The IMF's rosy projections are based on the assumption that the global economy will be on a more solid footing in the coming months. Yoo Jun-hee starts us off. On Tuesday, the International Monetary Fund revised Korea's 2017 growth forecast to 3%, 0.3 percentage points higher from its previous estimate in April. In its latest World Economic Outlook report, the IMF also adjusted the country's growth outlook for next year to 3 percent from the previous 2.8 percent. The financial body cited export-driven growth on the back of a recovery in global trade and rising demand from China as a key factor in its upgraded forecast. Indeed, Korean exports have been growing steadily in recent months, with outbound shipments in September tallied at 55.1 billion U.S. dollars, soaring 35 percent on year and setting an all-time monthly high. IMF Managing Director Christine Lagarde had foreshadowed the move when she visited Seoul last month, expressing a favorable view of the economy despite geopolitical risks emanating from North Korea. And we, of course, discussed as well the particular prospects uh, of the Korean economy, uh, of which the forecast, in our view, is 3 percent for this year and probably 3 percent for next year as well. The IMF's latest forecast is on par with projections from Korea's finance ministry, but more optimistic than views from the central bank and other local institutions. As of July, the Bank of Korea had expected the country's economy to expand 2.8 percent this year, while private think tank Hyundai Research Institute is predicting 2.7 percent. The IMF cautioned, however, that uncertainties over regulatory and fiscal policies in the U.S., Brexit negotiations, and geopolitical tensions could pose serious risks to the global economy. Eugenie, Business Daily. Two of Korea's biggest firms are meeting with government officials to discuss a possible safeguard measure by the U.S. against Korean washing machines. According to industry sources, officials from the trade and foreign ministries will discuss countermeasures with Samsung and LG Electronics. This following an announcement by the U.S. International Trade Commission last Thursday that imported Korean washing machines were hurting the U.S. industry. The commission made the claim after a four-month probe prompted by a safeguard petition filed by U.S. home appliance maker Whirlpool. A public hearing will be held next Thursday and its recommendations will be passed to President Trump by December 4th. Once seen as a thriving economic relationship, the U.S. has now become one of Korea's most troublesome trade partners. The country is now Korea's largest regulator of imports, with 31 items now under trade restrictions, matching that of India. Initially, most of the restrictions had focused on Korea's steel industry, but is now expanding into chemicals, textiles and machinery, with anti-dumping measures accounting for 22 of the 31 restrictions. According to Korea's trade ministry, and yearly average of 6.4 import regulations have been imposed on current imports between 2013 and 2017. President Moon Jae-in has laid out the blueprint for Korea's innovative growth policies in the era of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Speaking at the launching ceremony of the Presidential Committee on the Fourth Industrial Revolution on Wednesday, President Moon vowed to increase investment in industries that drive the Fourth Industrial Revolution, such as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, big data, and smart factories.
The president also pledged to provide firms in new industries a limited grace period during which they can do business without regulation so that they can test innovative ideas, products and services without restrictions. Korea's nuclear reactor exports could be about to rise after the state-run nuclear power company's latest reactor was certified by European regulators. The potential increase in global sales could help offset the Moon administration's push to phase out nuclear power here at home. Yoon Shin has the details. Korea's state-run nuclear operator's latest model of nuclear reactor is now certified for the European market. Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power says its EU APR reactor has been approved by the European Utility Requirements, an advisory group for the region's nuclear power plant utilities. EU APR design was built by modifying the conventional APR-1400 reactor to meet the European safety regulations. Getting approval by the European utility requirements shows that South Korea's nuclear power development technology can now compete on the global market. The APR-1400 was developed using domestic technology and was first exported to United Arab Emirates back in 2009. With the European certification, the company official said that it can now export the model to other regions that require EUR approval, such as South Africa and Egypt. At home, the government has been trying to move away from nuclear power plants due to safety concerns regarding possible earthquakes and is trying to increase its use of renewable energy instead. But the country's Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy said it is fully on board with expanding Korea's nuclear reactor business on the global stage and will support building plants outside Korea. Yoon Shin, Business Daily. Korean shipyards won the most vessel orders worldwide for two consecutive months, maintaining their number one position in September. According to data by Clarkson Research Institute, Korean shipbuilders secured orders worth one and a half million compensated gross tons, or CGTs, last month to build a total of 26 vessels. CGT is an indicator of the amount of work that is needed to build a given ship and is calculated in tonnage. Chinese rivals came in second with 21 vessel orders, while Japanese shipyards bagged orders for 12 ships. Last month, a total of nearly 3 million CGT worth of deals of 71 ships were placed globally, marking the busiest month of the year for ship deals. Hyundai Motor Group recently opened a big data center in China to analyze consumer responses and find ways to make better quality cars. This is a move that shows the automaker's determination to overcome Beijing's retaliatory measures against Korean firms. Our Lee jong has the details. Hyundai Motor's first big data center outside of Korea opened its doors to the public in Guizhou, China. Hyundai Motor, Korea's largest car manufacturer, is sharing a building with Baidu, China's biggest search engine. The opening ceremony was held on September 26 in Guizhou's Big Data Industrial District, home to global IT giants such as IBM, Apple and Alibaba. Pundits say that the move is part of the car manufacturer's intentions to get back on its feet after the Chinese government's retaliation over the U.S. THAAD missile system took its toll on Hyundai Motor's sales in China. We hope to use data collected from cars as well as opinions of our customers gathered through the Internet and social media to work on enhancing the quality of our products. Hyundai Motor newly established a product development center in China earlier in August this year and also released the all-new Reyna and Pegas, compact sedans made just for the Chinese market, as part of efforts to regain their footing in their largest customer base. China's THAAD retaliation should be used as a chance to reshuffle the industry for the good of South Korea's exports. Pundits say now the focus turns to whether the car manufacturer's efforts will pay off in turning around its sluggish business in the world's largest car market. Lee jong Business Daily. Moving on to our coverage of the markets, we have our markets contributor, Jemmy Kim, joining us on the line. Hello, Jemmy. Hello. So, Jemmy, give us a rundown on today's stock market action. Sure. Korean stocks are looking strong today, mainly on solid gains in the U.S. market overnight. 
The Kospi closed at a record high, 2458.16 points, after rising 1%. It also hit an intra-market record high today. And the tech-heavy Kostak ended 1.18% higher at 662.31 points. And the last time the main index made a new record was in July. Today, along with foreigners, retail investors were also big buyers. Now, could you give us a more detailed breakdown of what we saw in the market today, Jamie? Sure. The number one market cap, Samsung Electronics, hit a 52-week high, closing 3.48% higher as foreign investors kept unleashing buy orders. And SK Hynix, which has been on a bullish run along with Samsung Electronics, ended about half a percent higher as well. In general, medicine, IT, and machinery were on the rise. Stocks like Hyundai Motor was up 2.65%. Communications and food-related stocks, however, ended lower. SK Telecom ended 0.37% lower. Right. What market events should we keep an eye on as we head further into the week? Well, there are a number of issues on the global calendar we should be looking on the look. We should be on the lookout for that could affect the markets here and also, of course, worldwide. Tomorrow, the EU will be announcing monthly industrial production figures for August, while in the U.S., weekly initial jobless figures are due. And throughout this week, we will continue to have FOMC member speeches. This has been Jimmy Kim for Business Daily. The U.S. stock market continues to record fresh new highs with the start of the fourth quarter, which as a result buoyed Asian markets. To help learn more about the fourth quarter forecast for global markets, we have global strategist Daniel Yu from QM Securities joining us in the studio. Thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. And amid strong economic figures and renewed hope for tax reforms from Washington, the three major U.S. stock indexes showed um, jump to new highs. Will this right. trend likely continue in the fourth quarter? Yes, I think that the trend will, should continue. Uh, if you look at the corporate earnings, uh, it drives the equity market. Uh, and what drives the uh, corporate earnings is what's happening to the economic growth. Mm. Uh, if you look at the September PMI numbers that comes out from US, it's showing a record high levels. Uh, if you look at the manufacturing numbers, it's showing 13 years high. And uh, if you look at non-manufacturing service industry, uh, PMI numbers is coming out 12 years high. So uh, as long as these PMI numbers continues to go up, the corporate earnings should continue to go up. Mm -hmm. If the corporate earnings continue to go up, then obviously equity market will uh, go up as well. And also, as you said, uh, there is a potential for tax rate cuts. Trump is trying very hard to pass this uh, mm -hmm. law. Mm, right. Now, Asian stock markets like Japan and Taiwan did well thanks to Wall Street. Now, China's equities could be set for further gains uh, as they prepare for the party congress, including whereby China. Beijing is likely to announce some sweeping reform measures. Now, with all this in mind, will stock momentum remain on the uptrend in the fourth quarter? Right. I mean, if you look at the long holiday seasons, uh, all the Asian countries have shown quite significant uh, rise. Uh, you've seen Japan going up by 1.5%. Uh, you can look at Korea also going up by 1.8%. Mm. Uh, Taiwan, probably strong, strongest, 1.9% growth. Uh, China also going up 1.5% plus. So all in all, as you said, that uh, on the 18th of October, uh, there is the uh, China's uh, the meeting by the Chinese government. Uh, due to this, we think that there will be continuation of the uh, support measures coming out mm -hmm. to increase the growth rate of China. Uh, in addition to this, if you look at these countries, they are very manufacturing-focused countries. And in general right now, globally, equity markets going up because the economic growth are improving. Also, manufacturing industry is doing very well. So uh, most of these Asian countries with a strong manufacturing background or, or competitiveness should continue to show a rising trend. So we are seeing continuation of two-digit growth in earnings for uh, all these countries, including Korea and China, as well as uh, Taiwan. Uh, so even Japan is showing quite uh, improvement in terms of ROE as well as earnings. So on this benefit, we think that the Asian market should continue to follow what happens to U.S. Mm, right. Now, is Korea's Kospi index likely to hit the 2,500 mark if foreign investors continue to scoop up local stocks? Right. Uh, if you look at Korea, first two quarters, it has shown very strong movement, uh, going up by around 17% plus. 
But on the third quarter, because of the political issues and geopolitical issues and North Korea issues, uh, market has shown a correction period. Uh, mm -hmm. But since the mid-late September, market starts to go up again. Uh, with the U.S. growing very fast or equity market going very fast, we have seen Korean equity market catching up. Uh, so this week, we have seen quite significant move uptrend of uh, Kospi. So uh, all that matters is, is not just the political issues, but it's more of earnings and what's happening to economic growth. And if you look at Korea, we are seeing two-digit growth rate of earnings, over 20% growth in earnings this year. So with this, equity market should rise further. Uh, and furthermore, if you look into 2018, we are expecting earnings growth of another two-digit growth numbers. So if that's the case, yes, uh, 2,500 should be easily broken this year. Uh, probably it, it can reach 2,600 as well uh, by the end of this year. And even further next year, we could go another 10%, I think. Mm, that's pretty amazing. Now, will current equities be affected by trade protectionist moves from the U.S.? I've seen with like washing machines and solar right. panels and yes. talks to men, the South Korea U.S. FTA. Yes, um, I think you have to understand whether uh, this will have a major impact or not. Uh, you have to understand Donald Trump, the president of the United States. Uh, what Trump is trying to do is that they are continues to push the economic growth upward uh, by tax cuts and also continue to have a very liquid uh, monetary conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, what they are trying to do is they're trying to benefit the U.S. companies. So we think that the tax uh, tariff could be imposed, but not to the extent where it will increase the uh, inflation too much. So we're expecting somewhere between one to two percentage point of increase in tariffs. Uh, therefore, it will uh, negatively impact the Korean companies or major exporting countries. Uh, with this, I think that um, U.S.-led uh, continuation of equity market rise should continue in the future. Mm. Well, we'll keep a close eye on how the world's main equity markets perform in the fourth quarter. Thank you for your insight today, Daniel. Thank you. The average value of financial assets held by Koreans came in at 22nd out of 53 major countries, according to a recent study. German insurance giant Allianz Group says Korea's financial assets per capita amounted to 28,180 euros or 33,000 U.S. dollars as of last year. The figure includes cash, bank deposits, stock holdings, pensions and insurance funds held by each individual, subtracted by personal debt. On a more concerning note, Kerr's debt per capita was seen at more than $28,500, the second highest in Asia following Singapore. With Kerr's baby boomers now getting older and near retirement age, the country's working age population is shrinking with serious implications on the wider economy. Our Lee Ju Young has more. They were the main engines of Korea's economic leap in the 80s and 90s, the so-called baby boomers. Born between 1955 and 1963 in the aftermath of the Korean War, three out of every four baby boomers were engaged in economic activities. As the purpose of my job was to support my parents and raise my children, I had to work relentlessly. But starting from the year 2020, this generation that accounts for nearly 15 percent of the nation's total population is set to relinquish their population as the main driving force of economic activity and join the ranks of the elderly population as they hit the age of 65. As a result, Statistics Korea says Koreans aged between 15 and 64 will fall by over 200,000 in 2020 and decline at an accelerated pace in the following years. What's more frightening is the low birth rate that drastically falls short of replenishing the working age population. Experts say at this rate, the rate of annual decline could rise to as much as 500,000 from the year 2033. This drop in the working age population is proceeding at an increasingly rapid pace and is eating into our growth potential. 
With the rise in the average life expectancy, there are also growing calls to extend the working age to 70 in order to widen the range of labor participation. But a clear-cut solution is nowhere in sight. Lee ju Business Daily. Rapid urbanization often results in many socio-ecological problems, especially urban decay. Amid the growing concrete jungle, some neighborhoods in the capital are left behind in the process. But now some are trying to turn things around and provide a new lease in life to these forgotten areas. Our Kim mo tells us more. The neighborhood of Kebong Samdong, located in Seoul's Kuro district, is a low-rise residential area that had fallen into disrepair. Most of its public facilities, including roads, alleys and playgrounds, were neglected for a long time. But in recent years, there have been signs of significant change. Two years ago, this place was deserted. It has since been rebuilt, and it's now a community hall where villagers can take a rest and spend time with each other. At the community hall, the locals can take classes in yoga and singing or learn to make jam from fresh fruit. The first thing was that university students came and took a look at the inconveniences residents were facing. They started by renovating the stone steps and installed security cameras for us. We're very thankful and we're proud of them. These students were able to make a difference with the help of Seoul City's Residential Environment Management Program. The program first began in 2009. It puts on a contest in which university students select underdeveloped areas and submit ideas on how to improve living conditions, which they could get a chance to implement under the guidance of their professor. We've held this competition on a yearly basis, and for the past eight years, a total of 580 applications have been submitted. Out of those, eight have been selected and have been turned into real projects. The program doesn't end with the students just handing over their plants. Some participants stay on the villages as advocates, serving as a liaison between residents and city officials. North of the Han River in Seodemungo district, the neighborhood of Hongje Samdong is getting some help from two students and a professor. The team of three looked at the way the residents live and the inconveniences they face and came up with solutions such as installing security lights, painting the walls of kindergartens so people don't dump garbage outside them, and holding get-togethers for the villagers. By working here on site every day, I realized that things are very different from what I've learned from books. I learned that we should look more carefully at the people and their way of life too. At first, we were planning to focus on the architecture side of the project, but later we realized that creating a community spirit is more important. So we are now trying to get people together and help them share opinions that can develop the village. Thanks to the efforts of the team, Seoul City said it will provide some 1.8 million U.S. dollars for the development of the village, dispatching experts and installing facilities that could boost the participation of its residents. Locals say the neighborhood has had a new energy since the team started their work. We're learning a lot from these students. I was able to meet neighbors I hadn't met before, and more people greet each other in the streets. I think other residents are also slowly trying to make efforts to change the village. The professor supervising the team says all these efforts are to make a happier place for people to live in. Ultimately, people want to live in a place where there is happiness and harmony. And I think happiness comes from small actions where people can comfortably share their opinions with their neighbors. So we want to create a platform for residents to communicate with each other. The team, along with the villagers of Hongje Samdong, have been cooperating for the past three years to build a better village. As so, Seoul City plans to continue with its residential environment management program in the coming years and lift up more neighborhoods in need of a hand. Kim mo Business Daily. And that brings us to the end. Thanks for watching and we'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.